If the rest of you would uh, please find your Bibles, and we'll be passing out our outlines for the day. We have an interesting topic today. It's going to be tied in a little bit to Memorial Day, of course. And uh, some of you remember a few years ago I taught a lesson on this similar topic. Today we're taking a little bit different approach. We're going to be talking about so much more than a pile of rocks from the Old Testament. We're going to be looking at some Old Testament verses and uh, trying to develop some ideas for us when it comes to uh, remembering things, when it comes to memorials, uh, and what we as believers, how we should respond. And so uh, there should be pens in the back of the outline for you to take some notes if you'd like to. Uh, they're on your outline as well. So when you think of Memorial Day, uh, what do you think of? What do you consider when the idea of Memorial Day pops into your head? What do you think about? I'll give you a moment just to write something down, maybe there on your outline. What do you think of when you consider Memorial Day? What do you think of? A lot of different things, right? Depends on how you're raised in, one, in some sense. Depends on uh, how you were trained in some sense. Depends on what your experiences have been. Um, and so just want you to focus on that for a moment. I'm not going to try to tell you what you ought to write. There's not necessarily a right or wrong answer. I just want you to think about you and Memorial Day. When you hear that word, when you hear a day like tomorrow, what do you think about? What comes into your mind? So with that in mind, I have a couple, of, uh, three questions actually I'd like to ask you. I don't think these are in your outline. I, I'm not sure. I can't remember if they are or not, but I just want to go over them. So why do many churches seem to ignore Memorial Day? That's a question. Think about that. Brenda said, because it's sad. Maybe. Why do so many churches seem to ignore Memorial Day? Second question is, is it important for believers in America to pay tribute? We as believers, do we have responsibility? See, we need to think about that. And if we believe that, then we respond to that. Right? We act accordingly. The third question I have is, is it sometime or somewhat ignored simply because it's not a holy day on a church calendar? You know, it's not Pentecost. It's not Easter. It's not, you know, it's not Christmas. You see what I'm saying? So is it just simply because it's not a holy day uh, in the eyes of the Scripture that we just kind of pass over this sometimes as a church? And I don't believe that about us. I think as long as most of you have been around, we've probably done something about with Memorial Day because we think it's our responsibility. We think we have the obligation to give respect. So I want you to think again. Let's go back. Now punch down for me. Let's go back and think about the idea of Memorial Day. Doesn't even the name Memorial Day, doesn't it require some response? Doesn't the very name call us to remember Call us to think about, just like we ha we take communion. We did that, a, you know, a couple of weeks ago. We take communion. What in remembrance? Just the idea of communion causes us to remember. It causes us to bring forth some thoughts. And Memorial Day, uh, we should have some some thoughts. We should ha think about something. The key truth for today that I want you to think to understand is the ability to remember is a wonderful gift of God. The ability to remember is a wonderful gift of God. Now, I realize that every one of us in this room has some remembrances or the ability to remember things in our memory that we're not proud of, and in fact, maybe very sad and maybe even cause us to grieve a little bit. But we also have other things that we remember that are fabulous things. You know, one of the things that drives me crazy is I can be sitting in a restaurant and I hear a song from 1968 and I know every word to it. And I go, oh, man, you know, if I'd have washed that stuff out of my brain. But, but you know what I mean? So there's a memory there, and it comes forward under certain circumstances. And I don't really care about that memory being there, but it's still there, right? And so you have sad days that you remember or sad events in your life you remember. But then there's all these good remem remembrances as well. That, And I want us to recognize that if God gave us memory, there's a reason for it. If God designed us to have this, then ultimately it's for our benefit and His glory. That's what God does. 
for our benefit and his glory, probably reverse order that for his glory and our benefit. Isn't that the way God works? And, and so we got to kind of wrap our, ourselves around that. we got to wrap our, our minds around that and, and accept that there's a reason why we can do this. So the question is, what is made possible for us through the gift or the blessing of memories? That's for you to answer. I'm not going to answer for you again. On your outline, I want you to write a couple of things down. What is made possible for us, for you as an individual, through God's gift of memory? through God's gift of being able to remember something. What does that give to you? If we believe it's a gift and a blessing from God, what does that provide for you? You articulate that in your own heart. And it's important that you think about that and write something down because it crystallizes what your real thoughts are when you write it down. When you write it down. Moving on, I have a, another question. Would you agree there are certain events that we should never forget? How many of you agree with that? There are certain events that we should never forget. Some we should never forget. Would you agree with that? Like, guys, tell me some events you should never forget. Huh? Come on, guys. Yeah, your wife's birthday. How about your anniversary? Right? Your children's birthday. Okay, come on, you got it, right? So, you know, and, and, and that's true of, you know, some of the holidays we celebrate and, you know, some, some things that we do that we participate in. But I believe that Memorial Day is one of those days. I believe as a Christian American that Memorial Day is one of those days that we should never forget. Here's why. Punch down for me. Many of you may have seen an image like this. There, are, there is film footage. There are various productions of movies, etc., of this beach. Lee knows the name of this beach. Right, brother? What's the name of this beach? Omaha. Omaha Beach. Exactly right. Second World War. Now, a bunch of people gave their lives on that beach for what's going to happen tomorrow on the beaches of America. You ever thought about that? One is filled with joy. One is filled with celebration. One's filled with heartache and sadness and loss and suffering and blood and death. Isn't that true? So the fallen, punch down for me. The fallen are not forgotten by us on Memorial Day. And I want it to be that way. And you can say I'm over-patriotic, I'm over-political, I don't care. I believe as an American, but as a believer, that it's my responsibility not to forget what happened on that beach, what happened in jungles, what happened in deserts all over this world for our blessing. So tomorrow, people can go have a picnic or grill outside or go to the beach or the theme park, or whatever it may be. Are you with me, church? Thank you. Now, there's a problem, though. However, people tend to be forgetful. Anybody in the room ever forgot anything? So God gave us this incredible gift of memory, and, and he, he helps us with that, and he used it for his glory and our blessing. But the reality is, is that sometimes we forget. Now, sometimes we selectively forget. I'm not going to talk about that today, but we forget, and we seem to need some help jogging our memories from time to time. Would you agree with that? How many of you ever need help jogging your memories? Okay, well, so we know that. So in the Bible, we find the Lord, because I believe He gave us the gift of memory, He gave us the gift of remembrance. Because of that, He goes through the Scripture, and He helps us, gives us reminders. He gives us even memorials to jog our attention, to jog our memory, so we can think about the proper things. Now, whenever I was a kid, from the, from the smallest age, you can punch down for me, I can remember, every time we saw a rainbow when we were in the car driving somewhere or whatever, my mom or dad, usually my dad, would say, what does that mean? And it didn't matter. I mean, I was tiny. He'd say, what does that mean? Because he wanted me to be able to articulate God's promise 
every time I saw that rainbow. To this very day, when I see a rainbow, I think about God's promise to humanity. That he would what? That he would never destroy the earth by water again. Doesn't mean he's not going to destroy it, just not in that manner. Not going to destroy particularly flesh by that manner. Amen? And, and so that was instilled in me. And, and so I have that embedded in me. I have that ingrained in me. And every time I see that, what comes forward? That memory of my mom and dad. I mean, even when I was a teenager, they would say, what does that mean? You know, because it was important. It was important to them that I knew that concept. Here's what the scripture says in Genesis 9, 12 through 17. We're going to read the whole account. God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I am making between me and you. Speaking to who? Speaking to who? Speaking to Noah in reference to all of humanity. Right. This is the covenant that I'm making. Now watch what it says. Me and you and every living creature. So he says, I'm making a covenant with you, Noah, and what? Every living creature. So the covenant moves from just humanity. It's not just humanity. It moves to what? It moves to what? Every living creature is what it says, right? That is with you. And we know they were representative on the ark. For all successive generations, every what? Every successive generation has the covenant of Noah and the sign of the bow in the air. Right? You agree? I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a sign of a covenant between me. And now watch this. He not only expands it from Noah and the generations of humanity and all living flesh. He expands it now to what? And all the what? All the earth. Isn't that interesting? doesn't mean there won't be any floods. It means it will never destroy the world by a flood again. When the bow is in the cloud, then I will look upon it to remember. Not that God has to remember things, because he does. But I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature, all flesh that is on the earth. We go on down. It should come about when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow will be seen in the cloud. And I'll remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. And it goes on and said, And God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. So when you see a bow, do you remember? When you see a bow in the sky, do you remember? I mean, yeah, you can look at and go talk about the light reflection and all the, all the, the cool colors and all that. But guess what? It's much more than any of that. It's much more than what science thinks. It's much more than what the weatherman thinks. It's much more than all the pictures posted on Instagram or whatever it may be, whatever social media is going on at the moment. No, it's much more than that. What does it represent? A covenant of Almighty God to humanity and even to all the flesh. So let me give you a few facts. First of all, there's a Hebrew word that means memorial that appears in the Old Testament text 26 times, and I have that word here for you, Zikron. And that kind of sounds like something in a space movie, doesn't it? Probably something out of Star Trek, actually. But anyway, well, that tells you where my memory is. Anyway, and so it refers to a monument or to a memento or to a memorial, something that can be built or something that's actively recorded, okay, where you would have it in history. And it also refers to certain days and festivals that were set apart much like we set apart Christmas or, or we set apart Resurrection Sunday or Pentecost, the Hebrew worship is full of those kind of concepts, right? They celebrate all kinds of things in Hebrew worship. And most of them are some form of memorial for something God has done in the past, something God did in their, in their development and in their heritage and becoming a nation, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to share not all 26. I'm just going to share a couple of them with you today. First of all, we have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, people oftentimes confuse the Feast of Unleavened Bread with Passover. It is true they run simultaneously, but they're not the same. Okay, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is this. 
Now this day will be a this day will be a what? There's that word. 26 times in the Old Testament. A memorial to you. And you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Remember what he said about the bow? It's going to be successive generations. What did he say to the Hebrew people here? You're supposed to do the Feast of Unleavened Bread as a what? To celebrate it as a feast of the Lord for generations, right? And it goes on and says, throughout your generations, you are to, be, to celebrate it as permanent. What does that mean? Permanent. Yeah, okay. A permanent ordinance, a custom or a statute is what that means. So he told them, this is what I want you to do. Now, most people don't understand the Feast of Unleavened Bread, especially from our heritage. But let me just give you a quick reference to that. You can punch it down for me. The idea of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and by the way, at communion, we use what? Unleavened bread, right? You may remember that. But you remember the matzah that the Jewish people have? Well, that's unleavened bread. And they use that in this celebration, and for others as well. But they use it in this celebration. And it's a symbolic remembrance of Israel's speedy departure from Egypt. Now, hang on with me here for a minute historically. So if you remember, we have the Passover. And what were the people? They were in captivity in Egypt. Moses had been sent to lead them out. And the day of Passover was coming. What were the Hebrew people to do? What was the Passover about? Yeah, they had to put some blood of the lamb, right, over the doorway so that what would happen? The death angel would what? Pass over that household, right? And it would infect other ones, and affect other ones, but not them. And that was the idea of the Passover. It was God's provision, God trying to set his people free, right? But he, if you check out the scripture, immediately after the Passover, God tells Moses, get the people and go. And the concept was, and in the scripture, the concept is, if they're baking the bread, don't even let it rise. Get the bread, but go. That was the idea that was in the text. And so they were to go. Immediately after that, they were to go. Obviously, God had a plan, right? They might not have understood it, but they were to move out as quickly as possible. So in the concept of when Passover is being celebrated in the Jewish heritage, they also do the unleavened bread as a remembrance of God's command and God's instruction for them to get up and move quickly. Don't even let the bread rise. Isn't that interesting? And so that's why they're to celebrate uh, this as part of their worship. Another one I like to draw your attention to is the priest ephod. Now, ephod is an outer garment. And, and in fact, David was in his ephod only when he was celebrating the Ark of the Covenant coming in. And remember, his pagan wife got mad at him. His idol-worshiping wife got mad at him because he was dancing out in the street with only his ephod on, if you remember that, right? And so he dances, David dances the song. But here we have the priest ephod, okay, which is the outer garment. You shall put the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as stones of what? Really, same word. Hmm. As stones of memorial for the sons of Israel. So they're going to see this, right? You're going to see it. So when you see it, when you go to the Washington Monument, what do you think of? When you go to the Lincoln Memorial, what do you think of? You go to the Jefferson how, what do you think of? You see what I mean? That's the idea. Okay? So these stones are on the, the ephod as a memorial. And the sons of Israel, all Israel see it. Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders for a memorial. Again, the same word repeated there. So I have a little image for you uh, here of a priest in his garment. Now the ephod is the outer garment that's got the belt. And what happens? The ephod stones were on the shoulder of the ephod. That's what it says, right? And what were they there for? Yeah, they were there for a memorial. So whenever they see him, they're to what? Remember, right? That's a memorial. Just like the, the unleavened bread, they remember they had to leave Egypt quickly. This is in the same manner as, as a worship time for them. Now, let me share another one with you before we go on. The the priest uh, breastplate or breast piece, depending on how you interpret that text, in Exodus 28, 29. Aaron shall carry the names of the sons of Israel in the breast piece of judgment over his heart when he enters the holy place for a memorial before the Lord, what? Continually. 
So here we have the same word. It's to be a memorial. And the, and the priest is to wear this. Punch down for me. Let's look at this image as well. So we have the ephod. But not only that, and actually from the ephod hangs the brass piece, which has 12 stones representing what? The 12 tribes of Israel. And that was to be worn, what? As a memorial. See how all this ties into worship? And it's important because just like when we take communion, we think about Christ, right? And we think about his atoning death. We think about his life. We think about his, his resurrection. We think about all the things related to Christ. Same thing here. They're to think about all the things related to God and what he has done for them. And they're to be celebrating that as a result. So today, I want to talk to you about a pile of rocks that's much more than a pile of rocks. And like I said, five, six years ago, I taught about this, but I'm taking a little different angle today. See, there's a pile of rocks in the Bible that's much more than a pile of rocks. And we're going to look at that. So again, we're going to go do a little history. So can you punch down for me and give me a little map here? So in the Exodus, Moses dies. And the leadership is passed to Joshua. Joshua is one of the surviving members of the original group that came out of Egypt, correct? Everybody familiar with that? Everybody else died in the wilderness, right? He's one of the surviving members. And they're on the east side of the Jordan River. I'm going to walk over here so you can help you kind of understand. I should have had a little pointer, but I don't know where mine is. So we're on the east side. That river is the Jordan River. Up above that is the Sea of Galilee off the map. And on the very bottom of this is what we call the Dead Sea. They call it the Salton Sea then, okay, but it's the Dead Sea. And in between that, we have the Jordan River. During certain periods of time, the Jordan River is raging. And we believe that historically at the time that they were going to make this cross, it was a raging river. And we see the little star there. The little star is where they were camping on the east side. Now, some of the tribes were given land on the east side of the Jordan, and most of them were given land on the on the west side of the Jordan, and in fact, a couple of them were given land on both sides of the Jordan. So, but here we have them camped out, and their goal, their object is the conquest of Canaan. This land is known as Canaan. This is the promised land that God said, you're going to occupy wherever you put your feet, it's going to be yours, and you got to go do what I tell you to do. Now, they're, they're getting ready to shift into a different atmosphere. God was giving them manna. God was taking care of their clothes. All that's getting ready to change. And they're going to have to be responsible. And they're also going to have to obey God because they're going to have to go into battle. Remember Jericho? They're going to have to go into battle, right? But they're going to have to go into battle in a way that Joshua, who's a mighty warrior, isn't quite familiar with. Because they're going to march around the city and blow the trumpets and the walls are going to fall down. And they're going to go fight an AI, an AI, and God's going to fight for them, if you remember that. And so... They've got to be ready to occupy the land. That's what's going to have to happen. To occupy the land, they got to cross the Jordan River. That's a little arrow. And God told them to go across in this area. Now, I couldn't really find any good illustrations for this, so I decided to use Sunday school type images. Okay, so punch down for me. Sorry, I couldn't really find anything great, but y'all can live with the Sunday school images, right? So here we have a sample. Now, remember, this is not very representative because you probably had as many as a million people, okay, in the camp. I don't know how long it takes to move a million people, but I mean, it's going to take a long time just to get the word out, hey, we're moving, <laughs> right? And so, uh, it's, so here's an image, again, Sunday school concept, but it's okay. So they're at the Jordan River, and they got to go across, right? And everybody's camped out. And they've got to move across. So let's look at what the Scripture says in Joshua 3, chapter 12. It shall come about when the soles of the feet of the priest who carry the ark of the Lord. By the way, remember, they didn't have the ark of the Lord when they were in Egypt, right? So who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan will be cut off. Remember that word, cut off. That's important. Be cut off. And the waters which are flowing down from above will stand in one heap. Now, think about that. Okay, good. can you go back to the map for me, brother? I just want to show you what, it, what it's talking about here. So let's look at the map again. 
So the waters from what? Above, that's in the north, are coming down, right? And it says they're going to be what? It says they're going to be cut off. I want you to remember that. This is not the same event that happened at the Sea of Reeds, or the Red Sea as we call it. Not the same event. It's a similar event, but not the same event. That sea was what? Parted. Not this one. There's a flowing, flooding river, and God's going to go. And that water is not only going to stop, it says it's going to be cut off, but what else does it say is going to happen? It's going to heap up. Now, that's what it says, right? Y'all got it? Okay. All that's flowing down from above will stand up in one heap, is what the Scripture says. Okay, go back to where I was. Punch down for the, the guys carrying the ark in the river. Okay, thank you. So here we have what happened. The guys are to take the ark of the covenant, right, in the proper transportation order, not on a cart, but carrying it properly on the poles as the Lord had told them to, and they're walking, and it says when they put their sole of feet in the water, the river Jordan, what was going to happen? The water would be cut off and heap up, and they're to walk out into the river. So we have, again, a, a concept of that, I think, portrayed very well by the Sunday school type art. Now, Joshua 3, 16 and 17. The waters which were flowing down from above stood and rose up in one heap, a great distance away at Adam. Oh, go back to the map for me. Or do I have a map, another map in there? If not, go back to the map, okay? I want you all to see this. This is incredible. Okay, so they're crossing over here by Gilgal, headed towards Jericho. They're going to camp out at Gilgal, actually, on this night. But look where, that, where Adam is, where the city of Adam is. It says they stood up all the way back to that city. Isn't that what it says? And maybe it's because you've got to get a million people across this river. I have no idea. All I know is what the text says. And those which are flowing down towards the sea, what happened to the salt sea? They were completely cut off, is what that scripture says. Right? Go back to the text for me. Back to Joshua 3, 16 and 17, the second slide. Thank you. All right. Yeah, that's good. Thanks. So the people crossed opposite Jericho. Remember the map again, where they're headed across? And the priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on, say that really loud. Do y'all believe that? Let me ask a question. Is your God powerful enough to stand up the water, to heap it up, and let, you, let them stand on dry ground? If he's not, you serve the wrong God. Amen? If you can't believe that, your faith is not in the true God. Because that is what our God can do. He can do it then, and he can do it now. Amen? Do you believe that? See, it's important that we have that kind of faith to understand that. Now, it is true in the exit from Egypt, when they would cross the Sea of Reeds, that they cross on dry ground. So very similar to that event. In the middle of the Jordan, while all Israel crossed on dry ground, until what? All the nation, all the peoples had finished crossing the Jordan. So again, I have a little image of that, just to get the idea of what happened here. Joshua was not told to raise his hands or anything like that. Here they depict that. We don't have that in the text, but Again, the water's heaped up, all the people going across, the land's not dry, the artist needs to get his act together. Why is that water, why is that water sitting in the bottom of the river? Come on, people. Anyway, what can I do? I mean, you know, anyway, I can't fix everything. So next, okay, Joshua chapter 4, verse 5 and 7. Now, this is really important, what happens here after this, uh, after this image. Joshua chapter 4, verse 1, I'm sorry. Okay, and when all the nations had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, now listen to what he's going to do next. He tells Joshua, hey, Joshua, go to handle this. Take for yourself 12 men from the people, one from every tribe, one from each tribe, and command them, saying this, okay? So he gets 12 guys, says, look, guys, you need to go do this. This is what the Lord says. Take up for yourselves 12 stones from here out of the middle of the Jordan, 
So they're going to go in the Jordan River. They're going to get 12 stones. And uh, I don't know how big they are, but that's what they're going to go do. From the place where the priest's feet are standing firm, and carry them over with you and lay them down in the lodging place where you will lodge tonight. We know the lodging place historically was going to be around Gilgal. So, so Joseph, Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the sons of Israel. By the way, don't you like this servant thing right here going on? Remember, we just dominated some deacons. Servants of God that, that do what the Lord needs see, for the people of God. That's what's going on here. Same idea. And so they, they appointed them from the sons of Israel, one man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross again to the ark of the Lord your God in the middle of the Jordan, and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder. So at that point we get a little idea it might be a pretty good-sized stone, right? We don't know how strong they are, but they're, these guys are young probably. And so uh, put it on your shoulder uh, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. Again, we have an image here. Uh, that I want you to see. So they go back into the river. The Ark of the Covenant is still out there. The priests are still out there, dry ground. And they go out, and what are they supposed to do? What did Scripture say they're going to do? Yeah, give me a stone. I need 12 of you guys to go get us a stone and bring it to where we're going to camp out tonight. Now, that might have been a long haul. I don't know. I mean, these guys, you know, are, are carrying the stone to the place where it's going to be placed. Now, let's go to Joshua chapter 4, verse 5 and 7. Let this be a sign among you, so that when your children ask later, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Oh, wait a minute. Remember the bow in the sky was for who? Not only Noah, not only all flesh, but for every what? Oh, wait a minute. So when your sons come and say, what are these stones for? We got an answer. Let's keep on going. Then you shall say to them, because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And then it goes on and says, so these stones shall become a what? To the sons of Israel for how long? Wow. You think God wanted to plant something in their heart? Think God wanted to plant something in their head? Like a bow in the sky? Right here, there's some stones. And when your kids go see those stones, what are you going to say? The same thing my mom and dad said to me about the rainbow. It's a covenant between God and mankind, right? It's the promise of God. It's the promise of God. Right here, it's a memorial to the work that God had done. So a pile of rocks has much more. This pile of rocks was much more than simply a pile of rocks. You agree? It had a different meaning, didn't it? See, the untrained, the unspiritual, the unaware, the uninformed. Oh, a pile of rocks, how cute. Yeah, why do they do that? Hmm. There would be all kinds of speculation, wouldn't there? But we know the truth. Archaeologist comes upon it, all kinds of speculation. But we know the truth. However, a dear friend of mine, Dr. Roy Blizzard, only Gentile to ever be the head of the Hebrew department at the University of Texas, also a biblical archaeologist, master's degree, Ph.D. in linguistics, Guess what? Every dig he did in Israel as an archaeologist, he used one text, the Bible, to uncover fabulous sites in Israel. Kind of interesting, huh? Joshua 4, 21 23. Here's what it says. No, I'm sorry. I'm not there yet. My bad. There's a pile of rocks on your outline. We're on number one. So let's think about the Lord's desire here. There's this pile of rocks. It's much more than a pile of rocks. The Lord desired to establish Joshua as a leader of Israel. Who had been the leader? You know, in any kind of organization or country or whatever it may be, 
Whenever those new leader people always say, well, it's not like it used to be. Why don't we do the things the way we used to do? Well, that's not the way Moses did it. You know, Joshua's leadership wasn't to be like Moses's. It was to be completely different. He had a whole different calling in the conquest of Canaan than Moses had in getting the people out of Egypt, right? And so we need to understand that. So the Lord desires to establish Joshua as a leader for Israel. And in their hearts and in their minds, these people have to embrace him because they're getting ready to get into great conflict in the conquest of Canaan. They've got to have a powerful leader, and they've got to follow that leader, and that leader has to hear from the Lord. That leader has to be a man of God, and that leader has to lead, right? And they have to be able to take over Canaan, the land that's the promised land. Joshua 4.14. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, so that they revered him just as they had revered Moses all the days of his life. Can you see what's going on here? Joshua gave these orders. Joshua led. He did what the Lord had said. The Lord used him in a mighty and powerful way to lead the people into the, into the conquest of Canaan, to lead the people into the promised land. He was the leader. And in this event, he obeyed God. God manifested himself in miraculous ways. And because God displayed his miraculous power, through the work of the leader Joshua, the people revered him. They honored him as they had Moses, and they were going to follow him. Did everybody follow Moses? No. Some people got in big trouble, right? Same thing's going to happen with Joshua. But the bulk of the people do what? They understand he is the appointed person of God to lead this event, and we're going to follow him. Amen? Number two, second thing the Lord did with these rocks is the Lord established a dynamic testimony of his work among his people. Now, the nation of Israel is his people, right? Right? The descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? And, and this is his people that are moving into his land that he promised for them. Isn't that correct? And so here, uh, he had already done this back in the Sea of Reeds. He did many miracles in the wilderness, correct? Right? Manna every day, except for one right? He did many miracles. Their clothes didn't wear out. He did many miracles, right? But guess what? Those people died in the wilderness. New generations, like the millennials, are taking over. You know, just kidding. I'm glad the millennials are taking over. But anyway, they, we need new life. Amen? So, but you understand what's going on here? So we got a new generation of people. We got new leadership. We got new things to happen. And God wants to establish a testimony of his work among them. And the first thing he does when they go to take over the conquest of Canaan is he does a mighty miracle similar to the miracle that he did at the Sea of Reeds, but not the same miracle. The sea was split and, and stood up, right? Not this time. The river was stopped and stood up. Guess what was downstream? Nothing. If the water gets cut off, what's downstream? Nothing. How far up did he do that? All the way to Adam so that a million people could get across right? He's established, God has established a testimony among his people. Very, very important. Joshua 4, 21 and 23. He, Joshua, said to the sons of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what are these stones? Remember those memorial stones? Apollo rocks, it's more than Apollo rocks. Remember that? Okay, when he says that, when they ask the question, then you shall inform your children, saying, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. How did that happen? Just like my parents said to me, every time they saw the rainbow, what does that mean? Every time the kids asked the question, they repeated the story. They told them the account, right, of what happened here. For the Lord God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had all crossed just as the Lord God had done to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had all crossed. Praise be to God. Amen. Number three. Not only did the Lord desire to establish a testimony among his people, but he wanted to establish a testimony for the world that they could share. What do you think about that? 
You say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, okay, let's do a little history here. Battle of Jericho. Before Jericho happens, there's this lady. What's her name? Rahab. And some of Joshua's people visit. Right? And what did she say? She said, oh, I heard about that God. A testimony not just to God's people, but a testimony from God's people to the world. Is that any different than it is for us today? Do you have a testimony of the Lord in your heart? Do you have a testimony of the Lord in your life? Has He not done mighty things like He did for these guys? But not only is that testimony for us, that testimony is for the world. And God wanted His people to be light to the world and be able to spread that news about this God, this almighty God who could stop the river and cause the land to be dry for a million people or more. Some people say as many as four million to walk across. Is that a good testimony to share? Is your testimony good to share? Is it powerful and dynamic? Folks, what God did in you is just as good as stopping that river. I want you to believe that today, church. What God did in you to bring you to salvation is just as good as Him holding back that water and drying up that land. It's a miraculous work of Almighty God. And He's the only one, hear me, that could have done it. Praise be to God. Amen. So Joshua 4.24. For all the people of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is what? Is mighty. Hallelujah. The hand of the Lord is mighty. Say that to your neighbor right now. The hand of the Lord. Say it to your other neighbor. The hand of the Lord is what? Do we believe that, church? Amen. The hand of the Lord is mighty. They, he wants the whole world to know that. Not only that, so that you may fear the Lord your God forever. So, 3A on your outline. 3A. Everyone would or should know that the one true God, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is the mighty God. There is no other. They're moving into a pagan land. Rahab was a pagan. But she heard about this powerful God. And what did she do? She believed. And she's in the bloodline of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's a mighty work of God. Amen? B, 3B. The same God that delivered their fathers through the sea had now done a similar miracle for them. It's important it was similar because they had heard the story. Now they had more than heard the story. They had seen another one with their own eyes. Similar in that the water was piled up. Similar in that the land was dry, but not similar in some other ways. But it was still what a miraculous work of God that they could hang on to. And they put a pile of rocks down so that people could know what God had done. And it would be a remembrance and a memorial for every generation to come. And when their kids ask, what did God do? We can tell you what God did. Amen? Let's go back to the same verse, 424. That all the people of the earth may know it's God's heart. Not that any would perish, but all come to the knowledge of the truth. Right? It's always been God's intention for mankind to be redeemed. And so all the people of earth would know that the Lord is mighty. But also for them, that they would revere, fear the one true God forever. Now, folks, I'm telling you, they go into Canaan, and it doesn't take too many generations, and they're working, worshiping pagan idols, pagan idols, just like the golden calf. Doesn't take much time to take on. They forgot. They didn't revere their God. They forgot what God had done. Remember, we have a problem with forgetting, don't we? We already talked about that, didn't we? But what God does to help us remember properly is memorials. And that's what he did for these guys. So, see, the Lord intended for his people to always fear, to have great reverence, to have full reverence, 
of him and for him. Amen? A reference to what he did, a reverence for who he is. Every one of you that's a believer today has a reference for what God has done in your life. Should you have a reverence for that? Should you have a holy fear for that? So, this pile of rocks is much more than a pile of rocks. Amen? Punch down for me. And don't go any farther. So, we think about this pile of rocks, and, you know, we go very simply, it's just a pile of rocks. It's not a pile of rocks. It's a memorial of the work of God. How do you get to that perspective? You have to have God's viewpoint. You have to have divine viewpoint when you see those rocks. Otherwise, it's just a pile of rocks. Amen? So I have a question for you. I have a question. It's a hard question. Seems pretty simple. Do you have any rock piles? Do you have any memorial stones in your life? Think about that. I want you to write them down. Right there on your outline. No, we may not have a pile of rocks in our house. But I may have this plaque that somebody gave me. That when I walk by it, I go, oh wow. Praise be to God for that person or that miracle that we saw or that work of God. Or that blessing that they brought to my life. Or how I saw God work in their life. Or how God used them to work in my life. Those are memorial stones. Do you understand what I'm saying? And we should have a whole pile of them in our lives. And in our testimony bank to share with the world. We share them among ourselves. But not only does it stop here. We share them with the world. Just like they could give an answer. Oh, I heard about that God. That's what Rahab said. So I want you to write some, some of those down. You should have some milestones, except they're probably bigger than milestones, in your life because of the work of God. Amen? And it does you good to think of them right now as a memorial that gives a testimony of your God, the one true God, the almighty God, who's done a work in you for you to remember and a work in you for you to share. Write them down. There should be a ton of them. Just write two or three of them down. If you don't have a ton of them in your life, punch down for me, brother. I want to ask you a question. Why not? If you don't have a ton of them in your life today, brothers and sisters, you're not a believer. You don't really have faith in the one true God. You never really accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because if he comes in, he does a work. I want you to think about that. I'm not saying that to condemn you. I'm saying that to encourage you to believe in this God who can stop the river, who can make the water heap up, who can make the dry land for men to cross, a God who can change your very being, forgive every sin that you've ever committed, and give you the gift of eternal everlasting life where you are in the kingdom of God forever. Would you like to believe today? Amen. It's real simple. Just acknowledge God and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. And I know my sin has separated me from you. And I accept your payment for my sin, Jesus Christ. I accept him as my Lord and Savior. Forgive me my sin. And give me the gift of eternal life. And the Bible says, if you call upon the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. 
you'll enter a new relationship with this God Almighty that can do things you can't imagine. You want that? Just do that today. See, if you don't have a pile of rocks, you're either not a believer or you're not walking in faith. There are some of you in this room that are genuine believers but don't live a life of faith. You believe that you've got to do everything and make everything happen. Folks, there was no way Joshua was getting that army or getting that nation to cross that river without God. And you've got plenty of rivers to cross in your life, and there's only one way to get across them. And that's a trust in the mighty God that you have in your life, Jesus Christ, and in the power and the presence of His Holy Spirit. That will bring you across the storming river. Amen? Pray with me, please.